sponsored by Siemens Digital Industry Software. Learn more about their simulation and test solutions by clicking the links in the description. Build a better tomorrow faster with SimCenter. Hello everyone, and welcome to the tutorial on tank sloshing simulation. First of all, we need to understand what the sloshing mechanism is. The sloshing mechanism refers to the resonance of fluid in a tank caused by some external oscillation. This can lead to violent flow and damage to the tank structure. It is a strong, non-linear mechanical problem with a free surface, which is difficult to predict exactly. Sloshing can be investigated using numerical simulations and experimentation. Simulations can assist in the design and verification of tanks, validation of different numerical models, identification of critical issues, and investigation of the sloshing coefficient. There are several applications and research papers available on the internet that reflect on the significance of this simulation. For example, studies have focused on the sloshing effects on liquid oxygen tanks. When transporting gases like liquid oxygen, it is critical to consider the effects of sloshing, as they can lead to challenges during transport by air, sea, or road. Similarly, when transporting animal species like sea species from one country to another, it's crucial to understand the effects of sloshing. This is because these species are transported in high-pressurized containers, and understanding sloshing effects is critical. So, this simulation tutorial will help you simulate how sloshing can be replicated inside a tank. Let's discuss the recommended geometry methods based on literature. Different paper studies suggest that a rectangular-shaped geometry is better for the tank flushing mechanism. Two different regions can be defined, one for air and one for the water, achieved through segregation. Now, let's talk about simulation methods. The volume of fluid, or VOF method, is most commonly used for multiphase fluid simulation. The turbulence model frequently cited in research papers is the K-epsilon turbulence model. Regarding the scope of this tutorial, our simulation will be based on similar studies found in the literature. We should also consider some computational aspects. The feasibility of the simulation depends on your computational power. The cell count and mesh count can be large if using very large dimensions. Let's start with the very first step, which is geometry modeling. We will use dimensions from a paper found in the video description. First, open star CCM plus and create a new simulation. Now, Go to Geometry under 3D CAD Models and click on Create New. Create a sketch and select the rectangular shape. For the Y direction, we have 300 mm. For the X direction, the horizontal dimension is 1008 mm. Click OK to confirm the 2D surface. Now, navigate to the right view. Select Extrude and set the depth to 196 mm. Let's discuss symmetry options. Symmetry is optional, but it allows better calculation if required. You can use one-way or two-way symmetry. We will assign the face names for bottom, sides, symmetry, and top. To finalize the geometry, click OK. Update CAD and close the 3D CAD module. Right-click on the part and create a new geometry part using default values. Rename the part to Tank. This concludes step 1 for the creation of the geometry. Let's start with mesh operations. Select Automated Mesh Operation. Choose Surface Mesh and Trim Cell Mesh. Click OK, but don't generate the mesh yet. Now, let's adjust mesh dimensions. Initially, we had 1 meter dimensions. Change this to 1 centimeters for better precision. Considering our geometry is in meters. For mesh quality settings, keep minimum target size as is. Curvature and surface proximity don't need changes. Let's modify surface and volume growth rates. Adjust surface growth rate to new specified values for better control. Volume growth is set to fast and disabled, which is good for our simulation. For other settings, maximum cell size is relative to base, which is appropriate. We won't need post-mesh optimization for this simulation. Now, let's set up the physics. For the physics continuum, note that you don't specifically need to generate a continuum for the mesh. It will be automatically generated as part of the mesh operations. 
Choose 3D for three-dimensional simulation. Select multiphase and VOF for volume of fluid. Opt for implicit unsteady since we are simulating the sloshing mechanism, which involves unsteady movements. Select the K-Epsilon turbulence model for turbulent flow. For additional settings, enable adaptive mesh and adaptive time stamp for accommodating fluid movement in each mesh cell. For adaptive mesh refinement, we are going to use free surface mesh refinement with maximum refinement level of two. For adaptive time step, we are going to enable the free surface CFL condition with maximum condition limit of 0.2. Activate gravity as part of the physics settings. Include VOF waves in your settings. For multiphase, we are going to define two Eulerian phases for both water and air. We are going to select constant density and liquid. Now for air phase, we are going to use gas, constant density. For VOF waves, we are going to use flat VOF waves. The vertical direction is along Z axis. For VOF, we need to enable HRAC gradient smoothing. Keep rest values as default. To summarize, we've defined mesh settings, adjusting dimensions and growth rates, and enabled all required physics parameters for sloshing tank simulation. Let's define pressure and other parameters. Define pressure as a field function. This will be the hydrostatic pressure, since we are dealing with waves. Keep turbulence intensity as default. Velocity scale remains at 1 meter per second. For volume fraction, choose composite N-1, as we're dealing with two separate different phases. For water, we are going to use volume fraction of heavy fluid of flat wave. Let's create field functions. Now, we will refine our physics setup by adding x-directional acceleration and defining field functions. Let's start by adding x-directional acceleration. Open the definition tab. Navigate to automation field functions by create a scalar field function for x-acceleration. Use an equation to define x-directional acceleration, simulating the tank's movement in the x-direction. Click OK. If automation tab is not available in your version, then you would need to go to the Tools tab in the tree. Also create another scalar field function named water mass for the mass function. Use the volume fraction of water, density, and volume for its definition. Now, we'll import CSV for X acceleration. Create a CSV file with time and acceleration in Excel. Import this CSV into star CCM plus as a new table, break time of 3.7. Update X acceleration to use this table. Update custom reference values and check that they are now green. Rename field functions appropriately. Save your work to avoid loss of data. This concludes part two of the physics setup, where we refined the setup by adding X directional acceleration and defining necessary field functions. Now, we will define the region for our tank and set up the appropriate boundary conditions. Let's start by creating multiple boundary conditions. By default, one boundary is created. We need to create additional boundaries for top, bottom, sides, and symmetry. Name the first boundary as top, the second as bottom, the third as symmetry, and the fourth as sides. Now, let's set boundary properties. For each boundary, enable their respective regions to be used by the solver. For the top boundary specification, set it as a simple wall. Under Reference Frame Specification, choose Regional Reference Frame. Ensure no slip conditions are set for shear stress. Keep tangential velocity fixed and the wall surface is smooth. The bottom boundary specification is similar to the top boundary. For the symmetry boundary, set it to be a type of a symmetry plane. For the sides boundary, set as walls with regional reference frames. Ensure no slip conditions and keep all other settings at default values. Finally, let's check phase conditions. For both water and air, ensure the default settings are being used. We have successfully defined the region and set up the boundary conditions for our tank simulation. Now, let's define the solver settings. We've selected the implicit order but we can minimize the time step further to 10 to the power of negative four. By default, we have an adaptive time step. Let's change it to the minimum we selected earlier. 
We had 1 times 10 to the power of negative 4, so let's reduce it further to 1 times 10 to the power of negative 5. For the adaptive time step, it needs to be smaller, less than the unsteady condition. The settings for adaptive mesh, partitioning, distance, and segregated flow are good as they are. These are default values, and we don't need to change them. The maximum iteration is set to 5, but I think it should be higher. Let's set it to 15. Keep in mind, these values will affect the mesh condition and simulation time. For the maximum physical time, since we haven't created any iterations, we can reduce it to 0.5 seconds. Yeah, we don't need maximum steps, as we're dealing with iterations. Next, we have the stop file. Our stopping criteria is also defined. Let's save our settings and move on to the next step. Now, let's quickly generate some essential reports. First, we'll create the CFL report, then define a timestamp report, and finally, the watermark. Right-click to start. For the CFL, we need something without units. Let's use the maximum value report. Choose convective current number here. Click OK and select our tank as the part. Double check that we've properly selected the tank. Good. Next, for the time step, it is also unitless. So let's use maximum value again. Rename it to time step. The function will be the time step. Click OK. Ensure we've selected the right parts. Now, for the water mass, remember, we created a field function for this. We'll generate a sum report for water mass in the entire tank. Let's use the water mass field function we created. Tadam. Ensure all parts are selected. Tank, bottom, sides, symmetry, everything. Rename it to water mass. Water mass will be volumetric, representing volume. The default latest surface is fine for now. We'll have a volume option after generating the mesh. Now, let's generate a mesh and create a scene to visualize it. Let's see how our mesh looks. Navigate to the mesh section. First, we'll initialize, then generate the surface and volume mesh. All right, this mesh looks good. It's a decent mesh for our purposes. Remember, mesh quality significantly impacts simulation accuracy and computational time, so it's crucial to get it right. Let's save our work and move on to the next step. So now, let's head over to the generation of scenes. The first one we need is for the volume fraction and another for the current Friedrichs Louis numbers. And then, the volume fraction for air. Likewise, we already have the geometry and mesh scenes. So let's hover here and create a scalar scene. Let's rename it to the CFL number. And for this, we are going to use the parts that we require. Select all, we have all parts in the scalar field. Let's make sure that we have the convective current number enabled. Click OK. So we have the current Friedrichs Louis number defined. Next, we need the volume fraction. So click here, scalar, let's name it. Let's rename it to volume fraction. And here again, we need to make sure that all the relevant parts have been selected. So let's go here and select the parts. Click OK. In the scalar field, we need to select volume fraction of air. Click OK. We have our volume fraction defined. Let's not forget to save. We can create additional scenes if required, but I think we are pretty much good for now. Let's run the simulation. Initialize the solution. Let's check the step. It's working fine and no error, so the simulation should run smoothly now. Now, we're ready for the complete run. Make sure you've saved your simulation before moving ahead. Our simulation has gone over 5,000 steps. First, let's discuss the current Friedrichs Louis CFL number or the convective current number. The CFL number is a non-dimensional value used in computational fluid dynamic simulations to evaluate the time step requirements for a transient simulation given a specific mesh size and flow velocity. It essentially defines the stability of the simulation by indicating how much information travels across a computational grid cell in a unit of time. If the CFL number is greater than 1, it means that the information travels too quickly across a cell, which can cause the simulation to become unstable. In our simulation, the CFL number needs to be less than 1 to ensure that the information travels appropriately from one cell to the next. Looking at our results, we need to ensure the same, and this can be found at the tip of the wave as can be seen on the current CFL results on screen. This means that our simulation is stable and the results are aligned correctly. 
Next, let's examine the volume fraction. This measures the proportion of water in relation to air as we define the wave conditions and view conditions. On top, the red portion represents air while the other part represents water. As we can see, water is splashing and sloshing against the walls, which is expected since we applied acceleration in the x direction. If you recall the CSV table we created, this movement is consistent with the input. On one side, we also notice that some vapor content is mixing with the air. This happens when water gets in touch with air, which can also be seen in real-life scenarios, such as tanks sloshing, where a small amount of water gets lifted into the air. This is an example of how evaporation might occur if there is a temperature differential or turbulence. So, our simulation is running well and the results are correct. You can adjust different conditions based on your needs, such as changing the acceleration or applying more g-forces. These two results, CFL number and volume fraction, are crucial for this simulation. Additionally, you can create other results depending on your requirements. For example, if you want to observe the pressure inside the tank, like hydrostatic pressure, you can define that as well. To do this, go to the scalar field and select hydrostatic pressure, or just pressure. You'll need to create a sectional plane perpendicular to the x or z direction, and then select the part you want to observe. This will give you the hydrostatic pressure plot, but you should set this up before running the simulation. You can also create vector plots if you want to see the velocity contours. Select the vector scene, choose velocity, and then select the tank as the part. There are other reports you can generate based on the settings you made earlier. I hope this provides a good introduction to the results and how to validate them using the CFL number and volume fraction.